My friends, we are now in the season of Christmas, and I am so excited about that. Literally, I, I can't tell you of the great joy that I have for Christmas. You know, I'm a couple years into my seminary education now, and I know just enough theology to really geek out about all the stuff that's hidden in our hymns and everything like that. I'm watching little boys open open their presents at Christmas. I love that it's Christmas. But even with all the joy and the songs of great glad tidings, um, you know, singing of the, the little baby Jesus and how the, the joyful memories that that brings to me of holding my own children, uh, this year I, I can't help but want to lament at them. And I know some of you are thinking, like, wait a minute, but, you know, Advent happened, and now Christmas happened, and Jesus was born, and so Advent was fulfilled because we have Christmas, right? Yeah? Well, yeah, but Advent and Christmas are really about two very different things. Advent prepares us for the coming reign of God. And Christmas, we celebrate the birth of God in Jesus Christ. God came. Hallelujah. That's fantastic. But the prepared, preparing ourselves for the coming reign of Christ is preparing ourselves for God's kingship in our lives. The reign of God. And so more often than not, Advent is actually about the second coming. In fact, the word that it originates from is first used by Paul in Paul's writings. So that's already after Christmas. So this year, probably more than ever, although it was one of the best years of my life, I also was really looking forward to that day with no more tears. I'm really looking forward to that day when God will come in final victory and we will feast at the heavenly banquet and all will be right. Because I want to sing of a world at peace. You know, peace, peace, silent night. But even in the midst of singing those words, there's something within me just wrenching in my gut because I know that our world is at war. I know that tears are still shed. And in the midst of celebrating the birth of Jesus, we have even homes destroyed last night. Lives lost. So it doesn't take long of looking a little bit closer at things to realize that we are in a broken world. That's where we find ourselves. Even, even in the midst of trying to celebrate Christmas, we find ourselves in the midst of this broken world. And I, I considered trying to make a video uh, to highlight these things, um, but I opted not to because the images were, at times, too much for even me to bear. But if you care to take that journey yourself, you can go to NBC uh, Year in Review of Pictures. There's a list of 50 pictures, and I don't think you'll be able to make it through that, that list without tears coming down your face. Our world is broken. It's in need of healing. Whether it be from a refugee crisis that our world has not seen since World War II, or political leaders advancing and proposing discrimination based on religious affiliation. The implications of our world at war, or death of a loved one to terrible disease. Our friends leaving our midst, or something so simple as not having shortbread left on our desk by Beth Kellogg. All these things remind us of the ways that our world will never be the same.
terror attacks against the, the Charlie Hebdo facility in Paris. The larger attacks on Paris as a city later on in the year. From San Bernardino to Ankara, Turkey. From South Carolina to the Sambisa Forest in Nigeria, where Boko Haram is wreaking havoc on women and children. From the injustices of Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, to protests and riots in the streets calling for justice, to the violent retaliations, slaying those who are committed to protecting and serving, our hearts have been moved to prayer for all of these things this year. On a more trivial level, we may have been praying for a broken collarbone by a local quarterback, or whether or not Dez actually caught the ball in Green Bay last January. Our world is broken and hurting in so many ways. Yet, in selfishness we stop, stuff our stockings and spoil our children and grandchildren, and boy, it was that fun. My boy's got so many good things, and I've got a wonderful video of the joy on their face. I enjoy spoiling my kids, I must <laughs> confess. I, I get to do for them a lot of things that I didn't get to do as, myself as a child. And so I enjoy that. But if I'm honest with myself, it's out of selfishness that I enjoy those things. Yes, I mourn Advent this year because even I don't fully embrace the reign of God in my own life. Though I want him to be king of my life, I continue to choose my own desires instead of God's. <laughs> you know, as much as I enjoy seeing the joy on my children's faces, God is the parent to all of us. God is the creator of all things. And what causes us joy causes him joy. What grieves our hearts grieves his as well. So think of this, your grandchild gets kidnapped. You as a grandparent would want all your kids and your grandkids, all the aunts, uncles, cousins, second cousins, and everyone who knows you to devote 100% of their time and their resources towards righting that injustice. You may even expect it of your church family. I'm reminded of one of those particular images from that, that list that I referenced earlier. If you've been on the internet at all in the last couple months, you might have seen it. It's a picture of a young boy on a beach. This isn't a boy who's playing and enjoying the weather. This is a refugee whose family was fleeing violence. And this little boy and his brother drown. He is washed up on the beach. The little boy who was three years old. And I can't help but think, George will be three on January 3rd. And if he were suffering in the ways that we see around the world, I know, at the core of my being, I know that any one of you would give up even the clothes on your back to help that situation. Right? We would, we would do anything we could to help members of our own family, or even our extended family, or our church family, right? We would do that. To make sure that these children have a safe place to be. You know, we can talk a big game, and we can pretend that we would do that much. But even I must admit, that it's easier to turn and look away. And 
you to not deal with the uncomfortable situation of pain around the world. We talk a big game about what we would do to help if we could or if we knew somebody. Yet we find ourselves in an affluent area. The median income for our little geographical area, the median, not mean, median income for a household is over $80,000. It's a very affluent area. It's one of the most more affluent areas in the state and one of the more affluent areas in the nation. We're in an affluent area. Our economy has experienced more growth this year than we expected. Thanks be to God. Yet we, as a church, have not been compelled to even give what we pledged that we would do in missions and ministry for the year. We said as a church that we would do this much. And this was before we knew of all these tragic events that I've made. And so many more. Yet $51,000 still stands between what we said we would do and what we've actually done. You know, if we put our money where our mouth is, that $51,000 should be a surplus of additional monies that we're sending globally to help the hurting. There are hurting in our community, certainly, and we do what, what we can. We have resources here. But I don't know how many times somebody has come for the community aid fund and Dorothy has had to say, sorry, there's no money in the account. See you later. Try next week. Apportionments. We don't like to talk about apportionments sometimes. One of those... Uh, is the World Service Fund. It deals with stuff on the other side of the globe, mostly. We don't like to, to pay that one. It's not fun. The African College Fund. That's not a fun one to pay either. Education is one of the strongest tools to fight against terror. That's almost directly quoted from Malala, the recent Nobel Peace Prize winner. Education. And we as Methodists have committed to helping in that way. Members of this church would rally if one of our own were hurting in the ways that I've described this morning. And though there may not be somebody in this worshiping congregation. There are members of our church that are hurting. One of the fastest growing regions for Methodism is Nigeria, which is where Boko Haram is. It's hard for me to imagine that Methodist people are excluded from that devastation. There are missionaries and secret churches all throughout the Middle East, including Syria. It's hard for me to imagine that the Methodist people in that area are excluded from the fear and devastation of war. <coughs> My friends, we need to do more than talk a big game. We need to let Christ be the king of our lives. In any and every decision we make, we need to be concerned with the least and the lost. We need to be concerned with the people that God would have us be concerned with. And not just sitting, celebrating the peace on earth because our neighborhood is free of conflict. My friends, this Christmas, instead of celebration, I'm going to offer you a challenge. In the year of 2016, I want you to live your life as though Christ is born again. 
and has come again to reign as king and lord over your life that you would give your time and your money not just your thoughts and prayers for the sake of announcing that the kingdom of god is near that the kingdom of god the kingdom of justice and peace would come and live within each of our homes whether we're on this side of the world or the other. We live in a broken world. A world that needs the body of Christ to wake up and to live and to do the work of renewing the earth. We need to serve our King and bring about that new heaven and earth. My friends, as much as I would like to this morning, I will not be putting a cherry on top of this humble pie. There will be no happy bow to wrap up uh, this uncomfortable message. Instead, I offer a prayer and a scripture message. This might be familiar to you. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law and rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbor. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ. And so, my friends, I ask that you would embrace the challenge of Paul to the Colossians. Paul, who walked with Jesus, who first told us to prepare ourselves for the coming reign God, he says this, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive them through psalms, through hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. <clears throat> Ever since Christmas, not just three days ago, but that night long, long ago. Ever since Christmas, we have lived in a world of already and not yet. We already have God incarnate who came to be with us in the midst of our mess. The perfect example of how to live and love each other. We already have the Holy Spirit that strengthen us, strengthens us and enables us to love even those who hurt our feelings. And we also live in the not yet. We, I, not yet, submitted my entire will to God's. We, I, do not yet trust fully in God as my King. And so this year, I lament Advent and continue to sing the song of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus because our world needs that day with no more tears. But every day until then, I am already here.
to do something about it by the strength of Christ. Because at least we have Christmas.